Hey, hey everyone, Amora here, and you are listening to His Health, the podcast dedicated to all things love, health, and wellness for Black gay men. As you know, our show allows providers to share their strengths, weaknesses, and really everything that they've learned along the way in their journey to providing uplifting care for LGBT communities of color, especially Black gay men. Today, I am incredibly excited to be joined by the Dr. David J. Mailbranch. Dr. Mailbranch is a a board-certified physician, researcher, and public health activist with expertise in HIV, sexually transmitted infections, and LGBT health. He has authored a memoir about his father entitled Standing on His Shoulders and can also be seen on the Greater Than AIDS campaign Ask the HIV Doc on YouTube. Dr. Mailbranch currently resides in Marietta, Georgia and works in correctional health. On today's podcast, we will discuss the importance of being a patient-centered provider and also how Black same-gender loving men can change the narrative around HIV. Speaking of changing the narrative, the term risky sexual behaviors is a really loaded one for this patient community. And there is still a belief that somehow being same gender loving and black and male means that one is hazardous to the health of others in their community. Dr. Mail Branch is going to speak on the stigma behind this notion. A fun fact, as a child, David was a very picky eater and he wanted to be an R&B singer. He used to lip sync to R&B hits in his bedroom and some of his favorite artists were Freddie Jackson, Luther Vandross, Prince, rest in peace, and force MDs. I'm dating you, David, sorry. Another really fun fact is that Dr. Mailbranch is a stellar faculty member on the His Health CME CNE course series and is a co-anchor of the entire training cohort. For these offerings and more, check out hishealth.org, click the Continue Education tab, and enjoy four hours of free continuing medical education courses. Also, you can follow David on Twitter at dmailbranch. All right, y'all, let's get into it. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. We like to start with a little bit of an an icebreaker uh, when we talk to all of the His Health podcast guests. So um, just fill in the blank. Baby David was. (laughs) A picky eater. A picky eater. Are you still that way? Uh, No, not, not as not as bad as I was then. And I wasn't like notoriously bad, but I was a, I was a picky eater. I liked what I liked. I didn't like what I didn't like. (laughs) <laughs> See, that's interesting because you grow up, your father, is, you're Haitian, part Haitian, correct? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm Nigerian, and it's like, there is no such thing as allergies <laughs> or picky eating. I'm like, you want to be picky eater? You want me to a child? Sit down and go to bed with your belly growling. <laughs> right. They basically, my parents basically beat that into me after a certain point. Mm-hmm. Um, not physically, but just kind of like, hey, like, you're going to eat this or you're not going to have anything. And at a certain point you start trying stuff and they're like, Hey, that's pretty good. Hey, let me go ahead and try that. (laughs) Eat all this rice and spicy stuff. Um, (laughs) One more icebreaker. As a child, you wanted to be a blink when you grow up. I wanted to be an R&B singer. You Uh, a liar for real? I'm not even playing. Um, I used to, I used to have, I I forgot who bought it for me, but you know, (laughs) you remember like Brute, by Fabergé, like the um, the old cologne. And they used to have these bottles that looked like, my, if you flipped them upside down, they were like a microphone. Oh. So what I used to do when I was in like grade school, actually it was more like high school, like 84, 85. And that was a big time for R&B, like um, who was out? Force MDs, you know, Alexander O'Neill, Sherelle, you know, Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick were getting big. Oh. Um, Prince was huge. And so I used to, I had a full length mirror in my bedroom door and I would close the door and I would play songs and have the microphone and just be lip syncing for my life. And, um, (laughs) (laughs) so before RuPaul knew what that expression was. So I used to sit there and say, I'd go through purple rain. I would do Saturday love. I would do Alexander O'Neill. If you were here tonight, I'd do Freddie Jackson, rock me tonight. I would do Luther, um, house is not a home superstar, anything, that like hit me and I could swear like I was just performing um in front of that mirror. So you gonna be? Are you gonna be? Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was I was all in. I was literally all in on those performances and that you couldn't tell me I wasn't Luther in those moments. So hold up, you were lip syncing, but do you have a little boat chain? Is there a little Yeah, you got, you got no. Some no, I don't even try it. 
sometimes I'll screw around and, and, and hit a note here or there, but it's definitely unintentional when I do actually catch a note. Um, and someone would be like, oh, hey, you sound really crappy. And then I'll hit it. And I'll be like, I'll be like oh, my God, that sounded good. And I'll be I like, yeah, I meant to do that. Right. I meant to do that. That was my voice, son. All the rest of the stuff I'm just playing, that one note that I hit, that's my real voice. Right? You're one of those accidental harmonizers. It's cool. We talked right. to Lisa. <laughs> You're like, all right, ooh, a third above, ooh, below. We talked to Lisa right. yesterday. Right, and then I'll be like, what was that, alto? So I'm not even sure, but it sounded good. So. Z sharp. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we talked to Lisa yesterday. She told us, um, I feel like all of these medical doctors and providers we're talking to low-key want to be singers she was like if i wasn't a doctor i'd be a lounge singer in vegas and she'd be like she was wait like, who said this uh lisa hightower i mean we talked to her yesterday and she was like yeah really was, it was bananas <laughs> and she would not hit a note i was like come on a little barbara streisand she was like son you you doing too much yeah, here it's not gonna happen no <laughs> <laughs> so well this is helpful to get a little bit of a sense of what you would do in another life. And I think there's still time for you if you want to pursue that. Don't be afraid. Try something different. Well, I, I think performing, I think the way, I think I would have been a singer or an actor. And um, I could see actor. I, I, yeah. And I used to like do perform. We used to do comedy skits in college um, based on like minority life at Princeton and what it meant to be a black student at Princeton um, and kind of making fun of the institution, like being tongue in cheek about it. And we used to do these little comedy sketches and uh, we called ourselves <laughs> the Colored Comedy Crew, but all spelled with K's. So it was the KKK. And um, yeah, that was us. So we used to do these comedy skits, and they used to be hugely popular. We do them during April hosting weekend when the, um, the new freshman class that was being admitted for the next fall would come in and want to visit the, the college and get a sense of, you know, minority life at a, you know, Ivy League institution and we'd put on a cultural show or a talent show and we do little skits for like three years in a row, like my sophomore, junior and senior years. And um, they were immensely popular. They got more popular with each year because people knew we didn't care. We made fun of administrators. We made fun of everybody. But Those like acting yes, to me would have been a fun thing to do. Yeah. yeah, we used to do all that stuff. And like the performing part was a good part of it. So like for me, you know, what I do right now, you know, with public speaking, um, and some of the stuff with the YouTube series and, you know, if I'm being interviewed for, you know, a radio show or, um, or a TV show or a podcast or something like that. Like to me, it's like, it's part performance, like there's education and there's information that you disseminate. But to me, at the end of the day, it's a performance. And if you can get people to pay attention to what's going on through the performance, you get people to take in the information a lot better. So for me, it's kind of a low key way of um, you know, living out that kind of fantasy or that kind of dream of being a performer while still doing kind of the day-to-day -day medical and public health work. I believe it. And for the His Health podcast listeners, if you don't believe it, check out the His Health CME capsule cohort in which Dr. Mel Branch is literally the co-pilot across all four videos, four plus hours. He's an amazing, amazing co-anchor there. Um, a little bit more about your background. Um, we sort of went through all of your illustrious credentials um, what I really, really love about you is that you are quite literally one of the most um, patient-centered doctors, and I know you truly practice that. Um, mm -hmm. You quite literally dedicated your life's work to improving the lives of Black gay men, um, and it's about patient advocacy within HIV prevention and care. I'm really right. curious for the listeners to hear about what led you or inspired you to begin this work in the first place. Um. I mean, I think, you know, growing up as a young black gay man in the uh, 1980s was like my teenage years. So that was the height of an HIV epidemic. And I really wasn't sexually active. I probably wasn't really sexually active until I was like 19 or 20. But um, it's still, it was still on the back of my mind. And back then, you know, they were saying like if you, the four H's, if you were Haitian or hemophiliac, heroin or homosexual. And I was like, well, oh, you know, shit, I got two out of the four. So I need to really be looking out for HIV. And so that kind of got my foot in the door. And then when I went to medical school, just learning more about HIV. And then once I started doing clinical rotations in medical school at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, um, I think that's really where it cemented for me. And not only just the sheer volume of people that were being admitted to the hospital sick with HIV, but then also how I saw um, staff treating uh, the folks who were coming in with HIV. And this was probably the mid 90s. So you know, they were doubling, tripling gloves, um, mm -hmm. treating them like lepers, like people would 
go in and like com be completely disrespectful to them, like talk down to them like they were dirt. Um, and I remember just kind of watching these examples of medical staff and providers who were being just horrible people uh, to the folks living with HIV. And I kept saying to myself, I could do this better. I can do it better than they can. Um, and, you know, folks who are afflicted with HIV don't have to deal with crappy care like that. So mm -hmm. that's how I took it upon mm -hmm. myself. And I love how you sort of brought up the element of time. And we, we've talked to Theo about this. We talked a little bit to Lisa about this. He too has a, a trajectory of just sort of seeing the epidemic change from the 80s and 90s until now. And throughout your career, you work with black gay men in, in a number of different capacities from, you know, services, HIV clinician to research, um, to working in the capacity that you do now in a, um, in a detention center. How has your understanding about black gay men and the epidemic evolved over time? What, what is uh, different um, now um, uh, sort of than what was going on when you first began this work? Um, I, th I think back then, um, it was such a crisis. There was a, there was a huge sense of urgency. So like everything was urgent and I, I keep thinking, can I curse on here? I can yeah, curse you on can here. I don't know. Podcast, do it. So I keep thinking back to, um, <laughs> love Jones. I'm such a nineties kid. <laughs> so like, I think about one of the last scenes in love Jones where he says, I love you, Nina. And that's urgent, like a motherfucker. You remember that scene? Of course, in the rain. Oh, no, yeah. We, we stayed together. But, you know, me and I was just it was a hologram. So we're like, it's fine. I mean, like Love Jones is just classic. So, so I just good. it was it was urgent, like a motherfucker back then. Like it was like people were really dying. Um, people were dropping like flies. Like you would see somebody, and then hear out a few weeks or a few months later, and they wouldn't be there anymore. So there was a sense of urgency and you know, we were all doing stuff. We were marching, we were protesting. Um, we were doing a lot of advocacy work, a lot of community based organization work. I remember working with NASM in, um, NASM in, uh, Atlanta at some of the beginning stages when Ru Rudy Kahn had first started the organization. And, you know, some of that grassroots stuff was like huge back then. And I think over time it's kind of changed. I mean, one with the technology, it becomes more social media based, obviously, and the way people are doing things. But then also as HIV has become more manageable, the epidemic has, you know, really squarely focused on black gay men. And then, you know, the science has gotten better where people are living longer. I, th I think I've seen a change of cultural shift where people who are diagnosed now, and I've seen people diagnosed recently where externally they don't seem to um, react the way they did back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, like folks used to be like, you know, in tears and just like, I'm going to die. And, you know, everything is not this, that, and the other. And nowadays, I think people, when they get diagnosed, it, if they have some knowledge about it, they'll catch it. And then they'll be like, well, I need to go on medications, right? So it's kind of like more of a, a wake up call. I need to get my shit together rather than, oh, shit, I'm going to die. And everything's crashing down around me and I have no hope at all. I think now there's more hope because of the medication and because people are living longer, but there's also kind of that, okay, I'm mortal. Like mm -hmm. if I don't take medication, this could take me out. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a, there's a paradigm shift with that in addition to kind of the technology and, you know, social media presence and the way people kind of communicate about things um, in a way that they didn't do back then. Mm -hmm. In an interview that you did earlier this year with the beta blog, you said, we have to build a narrative about black same gender loving men that builds context apart from HIV. One of the things I've realized is that there are so many other things in our lives that add depth and understanding issues around masculinity, racial identity, father son relationships, creativity and education, just to name a few. I think we should consciously make a change from a deficits model that focuses on what's wrong with black same gender loving men to one that's more affirming. Um, right. I want to hear from you. What is the work that providers can do around that? And then I also want to talk about what is, what in your opinion is maybe outside of their grasp. What are some things that they can't manage or do with regards to changing the narrative to one that's more affirming? Um, I don't, I would flip that question on its head. I, I don't know necessarily whether that's something that's in providers capacity to do. I think that's, that's up to us to do that um, for ourselves. So 
I, I think for ourselves as same gender loving men, we need to tell those narratives and be a little bit more positive for providers. I, I guess if I were to say anything, I think they need to step into situations, um, not looking at someone who's black and or same gender loving and just immediately think pathology, HIV, non-adherent is not going to follow up. Mm-hmm. Um, and all these other stereotypes that kind of come into their mind. And so, but I think a part of that is us teaching them kind of what's going on and, and being an example. So there are providers out there that don't deal with, don't deal with black people at all, much less black men, much mm-hmm. less black, same gender loving men. So, when we come into their offices, that's the example that they have. And so if we just come in um, and we be ourselves and our authentic selves uh, and they have all these negative preconceived notions coming in, um, we'll be able to kind of dispel that immediately. And it just comes in with our confidence and kind of how we hold ourselves. And if we hold ourselves like, oh, well, you're the doctor, you know everything. And you know, I'm just kind of here along the ride. Then, you know, obviously they're going to respond to that and kind of take charge. But I think if we, if we get a little bit more affirming and let them know, like, look, I'm serious about my health. And if you're not on board with my health, then I can shop around and find somebody else. Mm-hmm. I think providers need to know that um, for good or for bad, we're, we're a business model and a consumer driven model in this country, the way healthcare currently is right now. So like it or not, people have choice. And so if you're screwing up, um, they can choose another physician, another nurse practitioner, another PA, um, another provider. And so it's not that kind of thing where I'm the doctor, I'm the medical provider, I know everything. So I think we just need to go into these offices kind of guns a-blazing about what's positive with us and what we need them to do for us to help keep us healthy. Not so much of, oh, I'm, I'm kind of coming in messed up and please, non-black or white savior, can you save me? you know, from myself, because I can't do this myself. And, you know, that mentality, because some, some providers go in like that. Well, poor thing, you don't, you don't really know what you're doing. You can't take care of yourself. So let me go ahead and, you know, I'm just going to make all the decisions for you and help you. And I think we need to break away from that. Provider to provider, and I'm not a provider, but tons of providers are listening who maybe there was a gap in their training or what have you, but they're here because they want to learn more and, and do better. What do you say to that provider who says, David, I hear you. I have 15 minutes, and particularly in this age of the ACA. There's so much that is expected of me. There's so many patients that I have to see and so much that I am tasked to do. How do I weave in this, um, you know, culturally affirming language into my work or ask the right questions without missing something? Like what are, what are some strategies or things that you do to hit that on the head? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I tell people, first of all, I don't think there's a, a black gay or same gender loving manual. Like if you're black or same gender loving patient comes in, these are the questions you should ask. Like, I don't think that's a, a formula. Like I, I wouldn't think, you know, Oh, if you're a, you know, Latina female from Puerto Rico, this is and heterosexual, you know, this is what you have to ask her. Like there's no template like that. But I, what I, I do think has to happen is that, providers, we need to check ourselves at the door and just basically say, what are the patient's priorities? Mm -hmm. What's important to them? So there may be a million different things on their list. And so we need to find out kind of if a patient comes in, this is a very realistic scenario. You have 15 minutes and a patient comes in with seven or eight medical problems and wants them all addressed in that 15 minutes. There's absolutely no way in hell that you're going to get that done and still be able to see all your other patients and still not get fired um, because of inefficiency at the end of the day. So to me, it's about saying, well, what, what are, what's the most important thing I can do for you today? Give me one or two things that <clears throat> I remember one of my mentors telling me this, what are the one or two things that if you left this office, you would feel like it was a success, like this visit was a success or you had your, um, you had your needs met at the end of the meeting, what would be the one or two things? And if they say, well, I need all eight, then obviously you know, you kind of have to step back and, you know, talk a little bit about that because that's just unrealistic for a 15 minute visit to have seven or eight problems addressed in a successful fashion. So most people can prioritize what their first thing is. Like it's like chest pain, housing, my mental health, you know, my HIV, what's more important. Like you could say to somebody that comes in, if a provider has a patient who they're seeing in an HIV clinic, 
And the patient's HIV could be on cruise control, but maybe the provider wants to talk about HIV the entire time. You know, how are you doing with your meds? How's your side effects? And if you know for a fact, the patient comes in saying, I take my pills every day. I'm not having any problems and my viral load's undetectable. Move on to the next problem. Mm -hmm. They've got that one covered. Mm -hmm. So you could say like, everything's good with that. What do I need to do for that? Otherwise, like what's, what's a little shaky on or What may I be able to help you with right now? Or what's important to you that's going on right now? Because lives change and people aren't static. So one day you could be really doing well on your medications and then another day you could, you know, have a death in the family, lose your job, get depressed and stop, stop taking your meds. And if the provider is not tuned into that and doesn't stop and say, well, wait a minute, <clears throat> you know, your mother or father died or you broke up with your partner. Um, are you seeing a therapist? Do you need to see somebody? Do you want to talk to somebody? You know, is this affecting all the other aspects of your life? Then we're missing the ball. So again, it's kind of about providers being fluid um, and being able to roll with the changes that patients are going to bring us on an everyday basis. So I really love that strategy of checking in with your patient off top to say what needs to happen in our interaction and discussion today that will make you walk away from this visit and feel like it was successful. I mean, it is such right. a great way to sort of narrow in and hone in on what's important to them. And in, in my perspective, and you're a provider, so of course you're more of the expert, but as a, someone who's just functioning as a patient, is that kind of thing is the thing that's going to make me come back and thinking about it in a longitudinal way, that's how I'll get to the other things on my list. And that is the mm -hmm. way that, will, you know, get the provider to give me sort of that wrap around full holistic care that I, that I need. Like the goal is to get me back into the clinic or into your exam room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people, and nowadays people want to do things their way on their time mm -hmm. and on their priorities. And I think, you know, a lot of people will, you know, black gay man comes in, he may be in a relationship monogamous with one partner they're married they have two kids he's not sleeping with anyone else his partner's not sleeping with anyone else and a provider who's maybe somewhat misguided may say well black gay man i need to really focus on you know prep and hiv and stis and this that, and the other and the person may look at them and say wait why don't you just treat me like you would a straight couple yeah or a straight yeah. patient who's married like you're not going to spend that exorbitant amount of time on that unless you have assumptions coming in that say to you that I'm automatically cheating on my husband or engaging in sex with other people, or one of us automatically has HIV or a host of other STIs. So I'm coming in here telling you, like, I know I'm a black gay man, but um, my focus right now, I need to, you know, find out what my life, I'm worried about my cholesterol or, you know, my uncle had colon cancer at 50 and don't I need to get the test about 15 years younger than when he was diagnosed? Like, those are the things like people, but we as providers have to be flexible with that um, and not base everything on the assumptions and not just because someone's a same gender loving person that everything has to revolve around STIs and HIV. It doesn't. And it shouldn't at the end of the day. And, and I think some of what you're talking about, and this is something that, you know, my team especially wanted to pick your brain about is what contextualizes um, how providers and really our society uh, looks at sex and intimacy between same gender loving men or really LGBT people, but for our discussions, black same gender loving men. And we have a lot of discussions around our offices around the term risky sex sexual behavior, right? Because it's so mm -hmm. loaded for brown and black LGBT persons. And, and if we look at framing this um, term in the public health research, it can feel like, you know, of the very natural human act of having sex and being intimate if you're right. same gender loving is somehow hazardous to others and the health of your community. You are a provider. You are also a public health researcher in your peer purview, in your discussions, in your work with public health stakeholders, NIH, CDC, HRSA, all the, you know, PhD, doctored up, accoladed up folks um, who, who are the scientists and researchers and the foremost, um, you know, published thinkers in this field. Is it possible for HIV researchers um, to, Think of how to destigmatize the sexual being of black gay men in the research, in the literature. Um, is that even something that's on the radar of that particular um, workforce? Yeah, I think it's on the radar um, as far as like how to get that phrasing a little bit better so it's not always a pejorative connotation. Um, because it is like when straight people have sex without condoms, it's yeah. natural sex. But when two men or two women are having sex without, you know, using any barriers or protection that's seen as risky sex. And I mean, I think that was part of the whole 
why the CDC moved a couple of years ago from saying unprotected sex to condomless sex, right? Mm-hmm. So, like with them, they started moving on that. But I, I remember clearly um, when I was working at the Student Health Center in Penn, one of the students came in and um, he was same gender loving, um, not black. I think he was either white or Latino, but the same principle applied is that he kind of came in and had an episode of where he you know, was either drunk or just decided, you know, he trusted the person and didn't use a condom and his head was hung low. He was like, Oh my God, I know I should. And he was, he was expecting kind of the typical judgmental response from a provider, like the finger waving, the paternalistic, you know, you shouldn't have done that. And, you know, even though the doctor him or herself is, you know, having sex without condoms all the time. And I remember he said, well, you know, I I know I shouldn't be having sex without condoms. And I said, Oh, you mean natural sex? And uh, he looked up and he just kind of looked at me like, what did you just say? And I was like, it's natural to have sex like that. Like, don't beat yourself up. I said, you did it. And yes, there are diseases out there. And yes, there's a lot of warnings. And yes, there's a lot of stuff that can happen. I said, but don't get it twisted for a second. You know, having sex without a condom is natural. We are trying to program ourselves to put on a piece of rubber or polyurethane latex, whatever it may be, um, that's going to make the sensation feel worse. It's going to make it diminished. And then it's also going to provide kind of an intimacy barrier. And if you read a lot of the literature with just gay men in general and sex, there's a lot to be said for, for going condoms and what that means as far as intimacy is concerned and about wanting to connect with someone else and how that is a is a badge of trust. Like if I'm going to forego a condom with you, that means I trust you. That means I love you. That means I care about you. I'm showing you that I'm willing in spite of all this negative stuff that's floating around us and all these, you know, potential STIs and HIV that I trust you. And so that's a big thing. And so to just erase that, erase that social context and say something like you're just having unprotected sex or you're just having risky sex really diminishes um, the human side of it and the sex positive side Uh, of having sex instead of, you know, just admonishing someone and saying, well, you're, you're having risky sex, you're having unprotected sex, and we're going to have to get you tested for STIs because you're at risk. You could Mm -hmm. say, you know, well, hey, you know, that, that is natural sex. Um, You know, you must really trust that person. Like, tell me some of your thinking about, were you worried about this? Were you worried about that? And, you know, why did you choose what you want to do? And, you know, what were you thinking about that? And instead just kind of unpack it a little bit rather than uh, take a kind of, punishment and judgmental approach. I think that that has to change with providers, but people don't learn that in medical school. People don't learn that in residency programs. It's not formalized training. That's something you either have intrinsically or you learn on the fly. Yeah. And I have to say that it's, it's kind of powerful in a a scary and confusing way. I would think possibly for patients, but affirming to hear that you just don't hear that from a provider that would come out and just say, it's Mm -hmm. natural to not use a condom. And it's right. such a delicate dance in terms of saying that without endorsing, condoning, stigmatizing, destigmatizing, mm-hmm. just flat out saying like, I get that it's challenging. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I think, I think the goal is you can do both. So you can be affirming of someone's sexual choices and then also be an advocate for their health. So, okay, I hear that you're, you don't really like condoms um, or that you don't like the sensation or that you really love this you really love this brother and you don't want to wear condoms with him because you guys have taken a vow of monogamy. Um, do you think there's ways that we can protect yourself, you know, in case blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, what do you want to do? And then just kind of work with them. Um, and I mean, there are times when, you know, patients may forego condoms and they're very clear they don't want to use condoms and then they come back with an STI. Um, mm-hmm. and then they get burned and that kind of changes them. And I don't think it's, it's seen as a failure on the provider's part that, you know, you didn't protect them from that. Cause at the end of the day, unless you're a pediatrician, you're dealing, you're dealing with grown ass people. Right. You're dealing with a grown ass man or a grown ass woman who makes choices for themselves. So you can give them advice and you can tell them you're not supposed to eat a pint of haagen ice cream. You're not supposed to get the extra large value meal at McDonald's, but they're going to do it anyway. It's so delicious. you can give them, you can give it cause it's delicious. So you can give them that education. Um, but I think, for providers, we have to realize it's not about us. So 
the, one of the hardest things to do as a provider that you learn is that you, when you come out of medical school and residency, you have this notion that every time you speak to somebody, they're going to listen to everything you say. Right. And every time you give somebody advice, they're going to be like, oh, this is the doctor or this is the medical provider. And they're going to do exactly what you say. And the fact is they don't. And then even if they do, you can still have a bad outcome. And it's realizing that you can't control all of it all the time. And that's a hard thing to tell all the type A personalities that go into medical school mm. that want to become doctors because medical school draws a subset of the population that is very anal retentive, very controlling, very disciplined, um, and is used to kind of running things and wanting to be controlled and also very nurturing and very um, healing, wanting to help people. And so when we fail, when we see a patient fail or a patient has a bad outcome, a patient dies during a code, a patient gets a disease that we are trying to protect them from, we take it personally, like it was some fault of our own, like we failed as a provider. Like the same way a parent would feel like they failed if a child had an adverse outcome coming up or went through a, you know, an experience in their life that, you know, really traumatized them. You think, oh, what could I have done to protect them? I think the same thing applies for medical providers, but we have to come to a piece that maybe we can't control everything. Maybe we can't control our patients uh, from experiencing some adverse outcomes. We can do our damnedest to try. Yeah. And we can give them all that education and we should give them all that education and try our hardest, but we have to not beat ourselves up and most importantly, not beat the patients up if something bad happens because that's life. That's life. Um, there's been so much language, especially as of late with, you know, regard to what you mentioned before CDC, um, we talked about it in your particular CME, but their latest release of not really new data um, regarding um, seroconversion rates for um, Black MSM. Um, and there's been a lot of talk around resilience, I think, as a bit of uh, a counter narrative to that constant barrage of really doomsday sort of um, data um, around um, care outcomes for this patient community. I want to hear from you what resiliency means um, in your work. And I also want to hear about how you feel about how it's being used today. Do you think it's a double-edged sword? Do you think it's um, misappropriated in any kind of ways? Do you feel some other way about it? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I think uh, resilience, the definition of resilience in its plainest terms mean that you have to be facing some kind of adverse or problematic situation and you rise above it. So it's not just resilience just in a vacuum it's mm -hmm. resilience has to be against some kind of stressors and if you're black and if you're same gender loving in this country you've got more than enough oppressive and negative societal factors that are pushing against you so resiliency is just going to be an automatic genetic adaptation that we have mm -hmm. and so i don't think it's a catchphrase um i don't think it's misused now i don't think the cdc probably knows exactly what they're doing with that or knows how to do it um, or I don't know whether it's some kind of brilliant strategy of the CDC to just every couple of years splash really negative statistics about us in the media um, to see how we're going to respond. I, I don't think it's worked up to this point, so I don't know why they keep doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but they usually do it based on estimates. There used to be a day where it would be hardcore numbers, right. and they would say, okay, we did this study, and one out of every three tested positive, or 46% tested positive. And that's been going on since like 2001. But this new one in two estimate was exactly that, an estimate. So if you're a black gay man, you have a one in two likelihood of this, that, and the other, which is based on a whole bunch of assumptions and presuppositions. And so you can't just say automatically, oh, my God, I'm black, I'm gay, I have a one in two chance. And I think they're thinking that these scare statistics right. and by putting the fear of God into people, everyone's going to use condoms or everyone's going to be on prep and use condoms or do some other forms of prevention. And I just don't think it works, but I did hear some encouraging news. Um, I was at a conference uh, last weekend or about a week and a half ago and Greg Millett had uh, not presented some data, but made a comment that some of the newer, statistics are coming out are, are finally showing a slowing down of the incidence rates among mm -hmm. black gay men. Um, and I don't think he was saying it in official capacity or right. saying, you know, he knows the numbers. He, he probably does know the number. He's Greg Millett, but he probably <laughs> has the numbers in the back of his hand, but he can't release them yet. So 
but he was alluding to the fact that something is slowing down. And so I do think something is working. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the day where we don't have to speak about the resilience against this barrage of negative um, media and, you know, public health statistical fire all the time. Um, it'll be nice to have a day where we can focus on the positive stuff um, and it far outweighs you know, this kind of black and gay equals HIV narrative that we see. And I can't tell you how many um, patients I have, have, how many younger brothers who are millennials and even younger generation now are coming up and they're just like, oh my God, I'm so exhausted yeah. by being targeted yeah. by, you know, researchers, by the media and saying, oh my God, you're black and gay. Do you know you're at risk for HIV? And they're like, oh, you know, give me a fucking break. Can I just live? Can I, can I finish school? Mm -hmm. Can I, you know, can I go towards my career? Can I study what I want to study? Can I love who I want to love? Like, why does everything have to be negative, negative, negative all the time? Um, I, I just don't think that's the right approach and I don't think it's worked thus far. So hopefully we'll be um, moving forward with other kind of more resilient and kind of affirming and particularly sex affirming strategies. Uh, speaking of sex affirming strategies, um, we have lots of questions that we want to ask you around all of the awesome communications work you're doing about broaching conversations about sexual health. Um, our listeners can watch you on the Ask the Doc campaign on YouTube um, that is sponsored by Kaiser's Greater Than AIDS campaign. And I'm sure that you get some really unique questions from patients uh, while also offering viewers insight on topics that they may not traditionally think of when it comes to HIV treatment and care and prevention. We're curious to hear what are, or what can you share with our listeners um, regarding types of questions that patients ask uh, doctors around their sexual health that some doctors may not think um, a patient would ask. Um, I mean, we've talked about this a many times, but it's mostly about anal health. I mean, hands down, it's about anal health. Mm -hmm. um, People are worried about hemorrhoids. They're worried about fissures. They want to talk about douching and cleaning out. Um, they want to talk about what kind of risk is involved, um, what kind of foods they should eat, like those kind of things. So anal health comes out, comes up a lot. Um, and doctors, I know for a fact, aren't thinking about them and aren't asking them. Um, and the problem with that is that we're just coming along now to this time where we're you know, doing this triple site screening of, you know, urethra and, you know, rectal and oral when it comes to gonorrhea and chlamydia. And that's great for, you know, kind of, again, focusing on the pathology and diagnosing disease, but just talking to somebody and saying, well, okay, you know, hey, do you have sex with men? Person says yes. So the conversation doesn't end there. The conversation should continue with a provider to say, okay, are you the top or the bottom? Are you versatile? You know, what role do you usually play with your partners? Um, and then talk a little bit about that, you know, and you don't even have to make assumptions with stuff, but you can say, you know, okay, if someone says, Hey, I'm a bottom, um, and I bottom for, you know, most of my partners that I'm with say, well, do you have any questions for me about like anal health or what you should be doing as a bottom that can impact your health or how to be healthy? And if you just put it in an open ended way, that way, mm -hmm. it, it lets mm -hmm. the patient know that one, you're comfortable and two, you're letting them drive the bus. Uh, you're not putting words in their mouth. You're not giving them information that really isn't a priority for them. You can say, well, what are your concerns about being a bottom? Like what kind of health things do you worry about or what health things have been on your mind about, you know, how to maintain your health and, um, any concerns you may have. And then the patient can say, well, oh, I don't really have any concerns now. Or, Hey, you know what? I did notice this bump or, Hey, someone told me, a friend of mine told me that I was supposed to be cleaning out with X, Y, and Z. Should I do that? But I think, you know, with providers, if we leave it open, I think the fear sometimes is that, you know, you're going to get this, you know, truckload of questions and, you know, it's going to extend the visit for much longer. But um, I've actually found the opposite to be the case. The more you kind of give them the hint that you want to rush out mm -hmm. and you want to go, the more of those last minute when you're about to close the door, oh, by the way, doc, things are going to come up. Right. You hit it straight on and ask and say, hey, you got any more questions for me? Is that about it? Like I've had patients come in with me with like a list of like on a piece of paper. Yeah. Like I had to write all this shit down doc. Cause I didn't want to forget it. I said, yeah. okay, let's go through it one by one. And then you could, you could either reject it immediately and be like, I don't want to deal with all this. Or you can be patient and say, well, okay, <clears throat> we've got 15 minutes and let's just see where this goes. Try to handle each one quickly and efficiently. And then all of a sudden, you know, you'll be like, is that it? And they'll be like, yeah. 
Hey, Bear. Okay, let's move on. And, you know, again, going back to what I said previously about prioritizing, you could listen to the whole list of eight and then say, okay, which ones, which, pick two of these that are most important to you and they'll pick them. And then you can say, let's deal with the rest next time. Or let me get back to you about that next time. Um, and that's the, that's part of the joy about primary care is that you can always follow up with those stuff, those things later, those different issues later. But I think um, if you were to say something that providers aren't thinking of or providers aren't asking about, especially with black, same gender loving men, it's going to be anal health issues. Well, let's talk about the primary care piece a little bit, because some of the feedback that we get is really great strategies. I'm a primary care doc, or I'm not an infectious disease doc, or fill in the blank, and those just aren't the questions that I ask. Maybe I'll ask, maybe I'll sort of routinize HIV screening, but going down the line and taking this comprehensive, um, you know, sexual health intake, is that really my purview? What what is your feedback for sort of those kind of providers who feel like that's not my job to ask those kind of questions? Um, well, I mean, it depends on what kind of relationship you want to have with your patients. If you want to kind of have the stoic, you know, I'm the provider, you're the patient. We're not going to really get into much detail about your personal life relationship. And it's just, you know, come in have a transaction, which means I ask you questions, you tell me what the problem is, I write a prescription or uh, e-prescribe you to a pharmacy and then you leave, shake hands and that's it, then that's it. But my attitude is like, you have a privileged role as a provider and you have an opportunity to influence someone's life in a very positive way. Um, and you're never that busy. Mm. It's just a matter of gaining the experience to do it in a more efficient way. Um, people will say the same things about screening for depression yeah. or screening for domestic violence. Those kind of things get burdened. And there is something to be said for that because like every two seconds, someone's saying, well, you need to ask these questions and you need to ask these questions. And they're not accommodating by expanding the, um, expanding the visit length out to 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And so to someone on the outside who's never been a provider or has never, it's very easy to say, well, you just need to ask these couple screening questions about depression. Yeah. But what if I ask it and the patient starts crying? Um, or what am I all, supposed to do? It's a whole host of things that I can't, I don't feel equipped to, to deal with because I wasn't trained to do that. That could be part of it. But the also part of it is the reality is that even if you're trained or comfortable doing it, it takes time. Yeah. And so if, some, if you say to somebody, you start asking them sexual questions and it is a legitimate concern, if it really opens up a discussion, that may be the focus of that discussion. And so what you can preface it sometimes, and sometimes I have done this and it's actually worked pretty well. I'll say, look, you know, I only have about 15 minutes. And so I just want to make sure that we can make the, the most of our time today. So I want to make sure, you know, what's important, really important, again, going back to them, what's really important to you that we go through. Um, and I'm going to ask you some questions and some of the things may not be as important, but some of them may be. So I want you to really focus on the things that really matter to you for today. Um, and then kind of go in it like that. And then that way it kind of lets the patient know like, oh yeah, I'm not the only person that they have to see today. Or, and you can still make somebody feel like they're the only person in the world. You can make them feel like gold in three minutes mm -hmm. or five minutes. You can do that, but it's a skill. Um, some people have it, some people pick it up and acquire it, and some people will never get it. Um, no matter how much training they go through, no matter how much CME yeah. credit they take or view. And so, so it's hard with some respects. And so some people will be, will have the capacity to, to go with it. And some people just won't. It really depends. So that was part one of our amazing convo with Dr. David Mailbranch. If you want to check out part two, you should go to the His Health podcast feed and find it there. Thanks for tuning in.